going to start from the beginning and welcome you to our Chat and Chew group. We've seen a video about you this morning and we saw your little clip from Forks Over Knives. And I wanted, the first thing I wanted to ask you was about your new book that you've done. You did a book about uh, ED and if you would explain to the group how you came to write that book and why you wrote that book because it's a great story. <laughs> Okay, well, first of all, ED is not eating disorder. No. <laughs> it is erectile dysfunction. It's pretty edgy of, of me. I, I thought I wasn't even sure I should do it. But one of the times I was giving talks, this was in Vancouver. I was standing in the wings, uh, ready to go on, and Dr. Neil Barnard was giving his talk. And I heard him say, I was lecturing about nutrition to a group of medical students and they all had their heads down, they were doodling, whispering to each other, and falling asleep. And then he threw out this statistic, by the age of 40, 40% 40 of all males suffer from erectile dysfunction. As if on cue, every head went up and he had their rapt attention from then on. And I thought, that's, wow, I'm Dr. Ruth, maybe the other Dr. Ruth, <laughs> not the sex therapist, but because of my website, uh, my Ask Dr. Ruth, I get all these questions from people who have these very same problems. And I thought, I got the answer that nobody else seems to. It's not drugs, it's not Viagra, Cialis. It is opening that artery that <laughs> allows for Direction. <laughs> so, and the way we do that is through diet and exercise. Right. And I thought, I have got to write a, that book on how to. I made it prevent because I want to get those people reverse, and I want to get those who are in the middle of it and cure those who have tried everything and have given up, and so permanently take care of that function. So Absolutely. that's, it's brand new. <laughs> and, uh, we also have your book here, Senior Fitness. We brought that in today. Can you tell us just briefly what that book's about and how you can yeah. write it? Well, when I turned 70, uh, my, uh, my editor, publisher, Martin Rowe, called me one day. And he said, you know, since you've just turned 70 and you're still doing triathlons, we need you to write a book on senior fitness. And I thought, yeah, up to now we've just been talking about breast cancer and how I uh, reversed it with diet and exercise, no chemo, no radiation. But the number one killer is heart disease, which is just as diet related as breast cancer. And there's stroke and there's diabetes and osteoporosis and dementia, all these other things. So I thought, wow, yes, I'm gonna have 10 chapters, roughly, I mean, this is my original thinking, 10 chapters covering the top 10 killers of all us Westerners and how to reverse it, talking about the dietary implications as well as exercise. So that's how that book came about. Great, great. The first one was A Race for Life, which Dr. McDougall, who was guiding me through uh, this whole fight against uh, right. reversing the breast cancer, uh, asked me to write a book. He said, we need you to write a book because women don't always listen to me, but they might listen to you who have been through the whole thing. Exactly. So exactly. that was the face for life. Great. <laughs> One of the questions that came up in the room was about that little bit of flab around the middle. And it oh, seems like some people, regardless of how clean they keep their diet, how good they do with losing weight, um, and she even said that she had a BMI of 18, which I think you had indicated is what your BMI is, but still yeah. she has that little roll around the middle. So how do you get rid of that? And does it take exercise or can you do it with diet? How, how do we take care of that? Okay, first of all, BMI does not tell you anything other than your height versus weight. And what you need to know is your body fat percentage. BMI doesn't tell you that. So if you've got extra fat, that means there's not muscle there. So what I would recommend for anybody who has excess body fat, there's no spot reducing, so forget right. that. 
the body decides what's going to go next. So uh, a diet with lower caloric density. And Jeff Novick talks about caloric density, yes. leafy greens. You know, you can do a fa- uh, what I have in my cookbook, uh, Chef. You can do a, a green fast. And boy, you will lose weight fast. True. But if you're exercising along with that, then you're, you're building muscle. Yeah, there, there. <laughs> and that's, that, that's weight uh, resistance training and all that, which I do three times a week, is, is lift weights. So my, even though my BMI is 18 and someone else's may be 18, the difference in body fat percentage may be 10% or 40%. So that's that's how you get rid of it. Um, so it's a combination of, of getting lowering that calorie density and getting some exercise and building some muscle. The first one lowers the body fat. The second one builds muscle, which is really important as you age. Right. We have a lot of new people in our group also, and as you know, we all know, one of the first questions that people get is, especially when you're an athlete, as you are, how do you get enough protein to be as athletic as you are? Yeah. Oh, that is such a common question. Right. And actually, what the reality is, most people get too much protein, <laughs> yep. and it causes damage to the kidneys. I think that's why we have this explosion of kidney dialysis clinics popping up all over. Right. Uh, animal proteins clogging our kidneys. So in the first place, no animal protein. Um, so how do you get plant protein? Well, there is protein in every single plant, even fruit. So if you were to average, say, throw all together, all the fruits and vegetables, uh, plant foods, you would average about 10% calories from protein, which is more than enough. Now, uh, being an athlete doesn't mean you need more protein to eat. What you really need is more carbohydrates, you know, the good carbs, because that's your fuel. That's what the muscles burn when you're competing or training or just your daily moving around. That's what your body wants. Yeah, and it's got to have. Mm -hmm. If you have a diet that is too high in protein, you're automatically deficient in carbohydrates and you you bonk, you know, that term when you're biking and you hit the wall, (laughs) marathon wall, it's because you run out of carbohydrates. So don't worry about getting enough protein on a plant-based diet. And I believe Dr. McDougall says, if you're getting enough calories, you're getting enough protein. Right, yeah. right, 10% on average, which is, well, it's, newborns only require about 4%, and right. nobody and grows faster than they do. That's exactly right. We had another question that came up about um, when you were diagnosed, we had a member who has a friend who's in her early 40s with three young children and has just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And Jane was impressed with the fact that you became active in finding your own cure. You became a victor rather than a victim. And her question was, how does she help her friend find her way to to doing basically what she did and taking care of her health and, and finding a way to fight breast cancer without possibly without going through the normal channels? standard American medicine. Yeah, yeah. radiation, chemotherapy, right. hormone manipulation, which all you has know that's horrible. That's what they're going to ever do. Yeah. And, and it doesn't cure. It does not cure because you haven't gotten to the cause. And to explain this to somebody who has just been diagnosed is really difficult. They're in a, in a most traumatic moment. So the first thing that you need to do for a friend is be supportive. Let them know you are there to help them. If they've got questions that they can't find answers to, offer to help. And you also tell them that there's new information. It's so new that most doctors don't know yet. You ask a doctor, well, why did I get breast cancer? And they will tell you, we don't know. And to this, I mean, mine was diagnosed 36 years ago. 
And that was the answer I got. We don't know what causes breast cancer. Well, Dr. McDougall knew. This right. is back in 1982. And so today, a newly diagnosed breast cancer patient is probably still going, and I know from my emails that asked Dr. Ruth, they're told the same thing, that uh, the doctor says, no, it's chemotherapy and radiation. Diet has nothing to do with it. Then you tell her, I, I know of a woman who has done this already. And it's been over 30 years, and the cancer has not recurred. And to, she wanted to prove that this diet was so powerful that she took on the Ironman triathlon, which uh, a lot of people don't know exactly what it is, but it's uh, <laughs> a 2.4 it mile. pretty brutal. <laughs> 2.4 four mile swim in the ocean. And then you do a 112 mile bike race. And, and the, by the way, two and a half hours for the swim, eight hours for the bike. And then the cutoff, you know, if you're not finished, you, you're out of the race. And then you end with a 26.2 mile marathon. The cutoff is 17 hours. Wow. And when I heard about this, because I'd already run marathons, I thought, oh, what I found out with the new diet was that I had more energy, I could run further, I could run faster, and I recovered faster. I thought, this is so powerful. It's not just cancer. It's not just cholesterol, which dropped like a rock. It is strong enough, powerful enough to enable me, a 50-year-old, almost 50-year-old female, to do that one of the toughest races in the world, the Ironman triathlon. So that's that's why I race for life and the, the picture of finishing that, just feeling, oh, victorious and empowered. So if you tell her a story like that and say, and you can email her too and she'll answer you. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so hopefully uh, offering that kind of support and people love stories. And so you tell her this story and, and see if you can get her interest and this would be a good place for your book i mean i think her book your book would be an excellent place for her to start and see what you were able to do right the first book a race for, the life. Race for yeah. life yeah perfect okay um and then we had nan rogers that talked about your friend dr janet kenneth cooper and oh yeah <laughs> and the uh, uh aerobics i don't remember the name of the book Aerobics. Oh, that was just the name of the book was Aerobics, yes. I'm looking at that original copy that okay. I bought. Let me, I can do that. Look at this. Okay. 1968. Wow. Aerobics. I was um, working for the Air Force at the time, a civilian GS-13. Mm -hmm. And I had a TDY, which is a, a military business trip. It's going to Korea. And it's a long, long plane ride. Oh, yeah. So I was in the, the uh, convenience store, and I was looking for something to read. And I saw this title, aerobics. I've never seen that word before. I wonder what it means. So I picked it up, bumped through it, and I thought, oh, that is interesting. There we, and he talks, Dr. Kenneth Cooper talks about how aerobic exercise and running is the most convenient the most one of the most effective ways to get aerobically fit fixes things from head to toe <laughs> and so i thought you know i in 1968 i was 33 years old so, and i'm starting to see little bits of flab and some varicose stains were starting you know the first signs of aging and i thought that's it i'm gonna read this book and and see if there's help there so the next morning, I read it. There are a lot of charts and graphs. So I got through the whole book uh, in one sitting. And the next morning, I went out for my first run. And I loved it. It was kind of um, exhilarating, empowering. I felt still fit enough to keep it up. And the next morning, I got up and I did the same thing. And the next morning, and that's why I start still do daily running because you know they talk about oh three or four times a week or right, you gotta have a day next in between to recover uh, no not with this diet mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. and if you don't know any better i did it every day so that's great oh a lot to to two men 
I should say two people, <laughs> uh, Dr. Kenneth Cooper, who has the Cooper Clinic and the Aerobics Research Center in Dallas, Texas. By the way, um, he, I gave him my, a copy of my first book and gave him credit for starting to get me running and doing marathons and the Ironman. And he said, I can't believe that you did this on this diet. Um, he said, you know, I want you to come to the Cooper Clinic and I'm going to see if you can break some fitness records. And sure enough, I did. Oh, wow. That's uh, great. Yeah. World fitness records, which he keeps track of. Mm -hmm. And he had, he's a, a showman. He has PR down pat. It's most people out throughout the world know who Kenneth Cooper is. So we had all these newspaper reporters and, and they were taking pictures of me while I was on the treadmill going faster and, and longer. And he said, and you've just passed the 30 year old fitness record for males. And oh, wow. he said, how are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing great. <laughs> and so he said, okay, you get closer to the female, you break the female record, closer, closer, hang on. And I did it. And and so Cooper said, see how important exercise is. And he turns to me and he says, you're going to come back next year and break the record you just set. I said, oh. Okay. <laughs> and but I you did. did. <laughs> I did. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so I owe a lot to Dr. Kenneth Cooper. He and I, by the way, are, are about the same age. Okay. And the other person is, of course, John McDougall, who is He's my my hero, my mentor, my guide. And, and I owe so much to not just saving my life, not just reversing all this knowledge about nutrition, but... Being an author, you know, right, <laughs> he was one who said, you've got to write a book. I didn't think anybody would read a book. I'm a nobody. But with this kind of backing, it, um, it, it's still selling. It, it, it does well. He's my hero. I, I, yeah. he, he's just done so much for so many. I know. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's getting better, too, I think. More people, at least, you know, now they know how to pronounce the word vegan. Right, that's <laughs> true. That's true. You're vegan as yeah. much Very anymore. Very good. We have one person, Sue, who had two questions that were really good, and they made us all think. And the first one had to do with cholesterol. She was very impressed with what happened with your cholesterol. What was it you went from, was it 236? 36. What was it again? 236 down to 160 in three weeks. Phenomenal. It was only three weeks because that was when my next blood test was scheduled. What we know now is that it started dropping immediately. When you quit eating it, when you quit adding cholesterol to what your liver already makes, and your liver, by the way, makes exactly what your body needs. So anything you eat, and all animal products have cholesterol. So I went vegan within the two hours that I first saw Dr. McDougall. He spent two hours with me. I mean, he's that dedicated, and I was interested enough that he showed me the research and everything. So I walked out of his office uh, never having any more animal products. So the next morning, my cholesterol was already starting to drop because this was excessive. Uh, the other thing that people ask about is, well, can you get too low? No. Uh, I suppose there is a rare medical condition where uh, you don't, but generally speaking, the problem is always too much. The question then arises about HDL and LDL. And does maybe the LDL doesn't stay, but the HDL goes down, or you know, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is they both go down because your body produces HDL to help carry out the bad cholesterol, and when you, there's no more bad cholesterol than the HDL, the body doesn't need it anymore, so that's why that goes down. So I don't worry about the ratio between HDL and LDL. The body knows what it's doing if you give it the right fuel. <laughs> and the fuel you give your body is whole foods, right? Whole plant foods, All yes. Right. No refined, processed foods. Mm -hmm. um, it, and that's why 
um, our shopping is primarily at the farmer's market. The produce that farmers grow is the perfect diet for exercise, for Ironman triathlons, for reversing not just breast cancer, erectile dysfunction, or dementia. You know, the latest research shows how important it is to, to prevent or reverse dementia and Alzheimer's. So they, there's so much to be gained from making this dietary change. Yes, it's obvious it works for you. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> 36 years on this diet, I think it's working. Yes, definitely. The second question Sue had was really good too. Now I'm gonna look at my notes because I wanna ask it the same way she asked it. She said that she personally was suffering from hypoglycemia. She had low blood sugar. And she notices that when she plant, eats plants, she does feel better. But she's having trouble about keeping her blood sugar up with just plants. And so she's wondering, can I maintain some of the cane sugars in my diet to keep that blood sugar up? How do you feel about that? I think you don't need cane sugars to keep your blood sugar normal. Uh, there's so much confusion about the word sugar because it means uh, how many dozen types of sugar are there? But there the, there are three important types. Number one is blood glucose. So that's the blood sugar. That's the one that's got to stay in this narrow range not too high, not too low. Then there's the cane sugar, the, the sugar that comes in, the, the, the white powdered stuff, sugar bowl. There's the sugar that comes in colas and, and desserts and um, what else? Artificial sugars aren't, are even worse sometimes. So the third sugar is the sugar that you find in whole fruit. That's the best example. I mean, there's some sugars in other plants, but uh, fruits are, are very high in, in their, their fruit sugars. Now, when you eat the fruit sugar, it comes with in a package. It's got fiber. And what happens, well, let's go to cola. Say you drink a can of cola, uh, high sugar, and it gets into the stomach and it gets absorbed so quickly. There's no fiber. It's so quickly that the blood sugar spikes, goes way up. The poor pancreas is saying, oh my God, this is terrible. We damages capillaries, uh, retina, um, everything. And so it, it sends out this bolus of insulin. And the insulin goes to work and brings the blood sugar down. But because it was a big bolus, it takes it too far down. And so you're now you're hypoglycemic. And so you have to get some sugar to bring it back up. Mm -hmm. But if you start out with the right types of sugars, I hate that word because it confuses so many people. Whole foods. There are fruitarians who eat nothing but fruit. And you'd say, oh, that's too much sugar. That sugar is fruits do not cause diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is caused from too much of the processed refined foods that have high fats. And it just causes all kinds of sugar problems, the yo-yoing effect. And if you stress the pancreas too much, you're gonna end up with type one because the pancreas just gives, gives out. Yeah. Another factor, let me just throw in, I just thought of it, is that exercise helps normalize your blood sugar anyway. So, uh, I can't think of a case where you purposely drink a can of cola, but if you did, go out and run. <laughs> you know, burn up that sugar before it does any damage. Yeah. So. And the good news is Sue does a lot of running. She, oh, she's, good. Yeah, so she's yeah. got that. Oh, the plant food, um, if she sticks to the, the plant food diet, it mm -hmm. should keep her mm -hmm. within range. Okay. Well, well, we'll be sure she understands that now, too. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
ask Dr. Ruth, because I know you sometimes get confused with the other Dr. Ruth, so, <laughs> but, and now that you've written this new fascinating book, I bet you you can get more confused with her, but um, I know you, I've been to your website, and I've seen some of your questions, but maybe talk to everybody about the kinds of questions that you get, and how you are able to help, even if I'm on the website. <laughs> um, the other questions I get uh, for the other Dr. Ruth are all X-rated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to. No, I mean, I've been shocked at some of the uh, the questions about, uh, uh, let me call them, uh, different sexual practices that kind of a, wow. <laughs> um, the answer that I give in most cases is... Uh, you need to clean out your arteries, which is a, a good diet, and um, get out there and exercise. So that's, um, I don't, I don't know, it, it's been a real challenge, and that, again, is why I wrote the book. Do you get good um, questions also about breast cancer and your history on that website? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, from okay. Can you talk some about oh. those and some of the some of the concerns that women with breast cancer have, and how you've been able to help them? Well, most of them that I've been getting, uh, you know, the the word is getting out to Australia, New Zealand, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Portugal, uh, lots. Well, across the United States, from almost every state in the Union I've heard from, and all the provinces in Canada. Uh, so the word is getting out. So more and more, I think when women are diagnosed, they go to Dr. Google, and they, they put in breast cancer. And I don't know where I am on the SEO rankings, but it must be fairly high because almost every day I have up to three different women who have just been diagnosed. And of course, they've been given this formula. Uh, we're gonna schedule you for chemotherapy and radiation. And a lot of them are obviously afraid of that because they've heard about the hair falling out, the nausea. And they think because the doctor is, you know, they're, they're almost gods because they, they know what to do. Uh, and then they hear this other opinion, so they're really confused. So what I try to do is explain that the chemo, the radiation, don't get to the cause. And if you eliminate the cause, then the immune system can then take over and do its job, which is to detect and destroy cancer cells. So that's, that's basically what most of the, the routine is. They ask for help and and in some cases they'll come back to me and, and uh, say I told the doctor that um, I, I want to do it with diet and uh, they they use scare tactics they say oh diet won't work and that's when I like to tell them well it, it does work for those who will do it and then I refer them to Dr. McDougall's website drmcdougall.com He's got a lot of his star McDougalers who others like me. I'm thinking about all of us here who are listening to you, and I've read some on your books. I liked where you said that some people, when they find out about an illness, whatever it may be, they're tourists, but they become a native. Yeah. And I thought they would like to hear that and share that yeah. with us. Yeah, you know, I wrote that so long ago that I, I don't remember <laughs> what that was in. But that came about uh, when I was out for my daily run and uh, the car rolled up and the window goes down and, and where's Waikiki Beach? And I say, oh, it's one block ahead and turn to your right and you're there. And that's when it occurred to me the difference between a tourist and a native. Uh, the tourist doesn't know how close this information is and how valuable it is. And the native, I mean, it's just almost second nature. Um, you know, again, I'll throw out 36 years doing this coming up on 37. Uh, it's just automatic and 
it, it's just really hard to get the tourists to, to try it. And some of them are open and there's no problem and others are resistant and all of my family, for example, um, uh, I don't know what it is, but they, they tend to think I'm a bit nuts, you know, a bit extreme. And yet, as Dr. Caldwell Estherson says, you know, what's extreme is cutting open the chest and, and exposing that and doing transferring blood vessels. And people call it changing your diet extreme. I don't know. It's, uh, of course, we're fighting big food and big pharma. Uh, and yeah, another part in, in my ED book is how <laughs> the paragraph heading is how to make a million dollars. And it is so true. You create a need here and then create the, the solution, the cure for it. And that's what big food does. They create the need. And here's big pharma with the, the cure. And it's not just a million dollars, right? It's billions of dollars that they're making in drugs. Some of these chemotherapy drugs are like $10,000 a dose. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, of course, we think if, with cancer being so bad, dementia is even worse. And I try to get a plug in towards the end of the book about how uh, the research is beginning to show that dementia is also diet-related. And that if you want to keep uh, your brain working, uh, you don't want to cure the ED and then forget what to do with it, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> People are uh, always asking me, where do I get my protein? And I basically tell them, don't ask me, ask Dave Scott. And as you know, Dave Scott won the Ironman Triathlon six times and was a vegetarian, the only one that comes right. close to winning six different times. Uh, my question is, uh, your routine in terms of exercise, do you run every day? Do you do stretching? Uh, do you lift weights? Uh, just like to know uh, how, how you vary your exercise routine. Yep. Okay, good question. But let me go back to Dave Scott. Dave Scott, unfortunately, was just vegetarian. He had cottage cheese, and he was so compulsive about getting the fat out, he'd rinse it off. And I talked to him because, you know, back in the 80s, um, we were a small enough group, we talked to each other. I was the only vegan, the, in fact, the first vegan to complete the, the Iron Man. And... Um, and unfortunately, Dave is no longer even vegetarian. He's gone to fish, which is really sad because fish, fishing is decimating our oceans, and that's a whole other subject, but it's vitally important. We've got to quit contaminating the ocean with our waste and then and getting rid of the, the ecology, the the fish that keep our oceans safe and and. Anyway, off the, uh, <laughs> let me get back to exercise. Um, I do stretch. Um, I didn't used to. D Dr. Jack Scarf did some research on his marathoners and found out that stretchers had more injuries than non-stretchers. But that's w when you're young, and you've got to do it right. And you warm up before you stretch. You never stretch cold muscles. So that's part of what I do is the, the warm-up, which is extremely important. And in terms of uh, other ex exercises, um, I mentioned earlier having a pool, so I was already swimming, but never competitively, so I, I got into that training. And then uh, cycling, I had a bicycle, uh, but I didn't do it with any idea of racing bikes so I got into that so here I'm doing three aerobic exercises and then as, as I was getting older into my 40s you know 50s 60s at one point I was reading about sarcopenia again that's it's in my ED book as we age 
you know, I'm 83 right now, and as I've gotten older, I've noticed that, yes, I don't have these big quads, you know, these muscles that uh, stood out when I was running. They, they've shrunken, and my bicep is not nearly as, as big as it used to be, so I started lifting weights, and I do that three times a week. I, I should say that's my goal. And so I usually manage to get at least two. <laughs> you know, things come up all the time. But it's when you're fit and healthy, it is so easy to get right back into the routine. For example, eating out or traveling can cause some real challenges. But again, you, uh, Dr. McDougall says you're never going to starve by missing a meal if there's nothing there to eat. Um, you can always find a banana at an airport. And there's nothing wrong with eating a whole bunch of fruit, again, as long as it's whole fruit with the fiber. So my routine routine is uh, a daily mini triathlon. So I, I get um, a lot of time exercising, but it's partly because I enjoy it, uh, being retired. Uh, how do I fill my days? Well, my mornings are, they start out with emails, and I spend the first couple of hours answering emails, and then I do my run, bike, and swim. And if it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I do my weights, and I'll be doing, I've already done my bike and run this morning. You know, I'm in Vancouver right now, so it's only what quarter to ten so when we get off the air here I'm going to go do my weights and then um, I go back to email <laughs> I'm doing too much sitting and uh, there is a disease called cititis you know that's inflammation of the, the sit muscles which I, you know, um, I'm trying to move now to keep uh, the blood from slowing down too much I think a lot of you know what DVTs are you know, deep vein thrombosis, and that's from sitting too long. So, we have another question? No, I was just going to say that yeah, I know you're familiar with Dr. Gregor, and we Skyped oh. with him last year, and he Skypes and does his emails while walking at his treadmill desk. So, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I know. That'll fix that sit, have... that sit muscle. Yeah. And we do have yeah. another question over here. Okay. I don't want to have room for a, a treadmill, unfortunately. I'd rather go outside anyway. Go ahead. I had to write this down because I couldn't do the whole thing at one time. So I'm going to read it, okay? Okay, uh, sure. I've had uh, colon cancer and melanoma cancer, my neck. And everything seems to be okay at this point. And the, the colon cancer is three or four years old, So it, and I've been released on that. I'm a believer in vitamin D very strongly believe in vitamin D. I've been told that sunscreen is not good and does more damage than good. Can you give us your thoughts on the skin cancer and the sunscreen? Yeah. Uh, one of the talks I gave once was use broccoli as your sunscreen. And that um, there is a uh, an EDD, a doctor, uh, Mark Sorensen, who's written several books on sun. And the, he's a, as much of a believer in vitamin D as you are. Uh, but he says no sunscreen because of those chemicals. And in my own case, um, in Hawaii, <laughs> you can imagine what the sun exposure is during an Ironman because the you're out there from seven in the morning till it closes down at midnight, but the sun goes down at say around six or seven. And with the swim and the bike and the first part of the marathon, you, you're getting full sun exposure. And most of the other triathletes use sunblocks, and I never did because I, I, I just hate, well, partly lazy. <laughs> I just uh, didn't want to take the time to put this stuff on me, and I just intuitively felt it wasn't any good. 
Um, having said that, I have been diagnosed with one uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, because I, I have a, my favorite dermatologist and she goes over me regularly and she caught it early and it was just a, a simple surgery, you know, they just kind of scoop it out and that's it. But if you're eating uh, lots of vegetables like, like broccoli and the tomatoes with their lycopene, you kind of have a built-in protection. And melanoma is not just totally sun-related. In fact, it may not be related at all. Uh, if you know much about melanoma, it can pop up in the most obscure places like the soles of the feet or in the, in the eye places uh, in, the, in the rear end, the places that the sun don't shine, as they say. So it's not directly sun exposure. It's a failure of the immune system to detect and destroy cancer cells. So that's what I say. That's my take on, on vitamin D. I've been doing this about a year, and I'm fine at home fixing my own meals. But we're retired. We go out a lot. Our friends and our families think we're crazy. How do yeah. you, you mentioned your family earlier. And you're famous and have results. And so people are going to listen to you. Our families just, they, they think we're crazy. <laughs> How do you deal? What do you do when you go out to eat? Give, just give us a few hints. That's my question. Oh, like, how do you yeah. deal with other people? Yeah, it's a real challenge. And um, I know that a lot of people listen and a lot don't. In fact, I have a, an old running friend who uh, somebody told me that uh, what she tells other people is, oh, don't talk to her about nutrition. <laughs> you know, she'll, uh, so I, some people are turned off by it. Uh, my family in general has been turned off. They, will, they won't listen for to you and what you're saying. I like to drop little comments, little tips like, uh, uh, oh good, lots of protein, complete protein in this. You know, people think that you have to combine foods. You don't, it's complete protein. And I make these little comments and then hopefully, especially with my family, if they come up with some diagnosis that shocks them, uh, oh, you've got heart disease, or you've got cancer, or you've got osteoporosis, or you've got arthritis, they'll come to you and say, what do you know about that? Or does your diet help that? And if you're armed with this information, you say, yes. And that's the teachable moment. And I guess we were cut off when I was talking about that because I, um, I didn't see any movement. So uh, anyway, I just kept on talking because I didn't know if you could hear me or not. But you've got to wait for that horse that's ready to drink. You know, the, the, the water's there, the information is there, and when they're ready, they'll listen. And, and I think the, the world is changing somewhat because you, you see newspaper articles or a, a thing on YouTube. Doctor, you mentioned Dr. Greger, but there are lots of other vegans that are getting out there and trying to get the information out. It's changing. Believe me, from 1982 to now is a big difference. I think what's difficult for some people, especially when you're new, is going out to eat with another group and you seem to be the difficult person because now I have to order my salad a certain way and I have to bring my own salad dressing and I have to tell them how to prepare my asparagus and I have to tell them what not to put on my potato. And so the people around you begin to feel like, well, she's just a royal pain. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? I know how I deal with it, but sometimes newbies don't know how to do that. How do you deal with that? Uh, try not to make a big deal out of it. As far as, as dressing, I just uh, use balsamic vinegar. Uh, you know, real simple. To, uh, just bring me some uh, balsamic vinegar. I like buffets because that way... In fact, that's, that's all I've done with both family and friends. 
because I, I go to the salad bar and I get this big plate you know, piled high with all these veggies and then balsamic vinegar on it. And it's, you know, and I'm going, oh, yeah, this is so good. It tastes great. And, you know, they look at me and, and, and it's, it's kind of subliminal in some cases. They know that somebody else can eat that way it can be enjoyable and that again you got to wait for that time when they they are ready to listen in a regular restaurant yeah it can be uh, a pain uh, that's why we started the vegetarian society of hawaii back in 1990 because dr mcdougall had had his group of patients there were six or eight of us that when he left moved to california from hawaii we all felt stranded. <laughs> what are we going to do? Uh, we knew each other, and so we started the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, and that, uh, again, 1990, so we've been going for 26 years now, and uh, 20, 28? <laughs> anyway, a long time. So uh, my circle of friends are all vegan, it, and that's what you can do in, in Back home, wherever you are, this group that you're in right now is, is perfect if it's close enough geographically. If it's not, uh, start a group. Start doing potlucks and have each person follow these guidelines. You know, whole foods, uh, fruits, vegetables, no oils, and then label the ingredients on your dish. And you can convert a lot of people that way. Yeah, we got to build our own support. Dr. Ruth, I'm Nanette Rogers, and I'm 83 almost. And oh, so, my gosh. Thank you. So we have a gift for you. Julie's going to stand up on this side. We want to share it with everybody. And Sue's going to be on this side because we're, we're going to give two of your books today. Two people will receive the door prize. You can see I've been reading the books, too. And I also have your ED on my iPhone. So the first thing we're going to give you is this t-shirt and it says, as you age, not only will you stay healthy and beat disease, but you can stay healthy collecting medals. <laughs> so here are the medals. Now we know that some of us do win medals and some of us run and get a finisher medal. So I just completed the aching quad last week. I ran four races in 24 hours. I ran a 5K that night. I got up the next morning and ran a one mile sprint. I do it in 12 minutes. And then I ran a two mile and then we went home and came back and ran another 5K. So we're going to wow. give you... But what I think is so wonderful is everyone receives a finisher medal because everyone in this room is not going to be getting up like I do and running, but they move. They eat right, and they're very healthy because they are whole food plant strong. So we well, wanted to tell you that Julie and I just came back from the Dominican Republic with Dr. Colin Campbell. Hold those just a minute. And, uh, and Karen and his daughter Leanne and Dr. Campbell has written on the back of this one book we're giving you, The Lifelong Running, so somebody will get that. Dr. Campbell said hello. And we also oh. know that Dr. Neil Barnard wrote on the front of the other book. So we are so delighted to know that you have been here with us. And I do have your ED on my iPhone to pass along to people to read. <laughs> so Julie, and thank you, will be running a 13 mile tomorrow. And she's 74. We're all in the same. And, and Sue is 70. Sue is 72. And we all run half marathons. Now, she's getting ready to run a whole marathon. But at my age, I may just keep it a half. I'll run two halves to make a whole. So I wanted to close. And did you want to say anything else? But Kathy has been the one who has gotten me to this point at age 83. You can wow. learn. This is what you wrote in one of your books. You can learn to love what's good for you, eating the whole food plant-based diet. And I have done that from age earlier to now. I am whole food plant-based. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. We're mailing these to you. Now, you can give away the medals. I've got
got about a hundred medals, but I can't beat yours. But if you'd like to remember <laughs> us and keep this when we'd be honored, or you can just re-gift it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we've had wow. you for a whole hour, and we don't want to be selfish. We want you to get that swim in and do your weightlifting. Is yep. there anything that you would like to say to the group before we say goodbye? I think you've answered all our questions, unless there's something you would like to say. Well, I want to thank you for a unique experience. I've never done anything like this before. This is your first Skype. And yeah, it's great. Thank you. We're, we're used to having Thank stuffy you. doctors that talk about studies and scientific stuff, and you have been delightful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Uh, call me on Ask Dr. Ruth, and let me okay. talk to you on, on email. On and maybe website. we'll do this again sometime. Great. Thank okay. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.